We are back. This is episode 288 of the Dark Windows podcast. My name is Kevin. And my name is Kevin as well. And oh boy, this is uh, this is going to be an interesting episode because we have never really done anything like this before. Um, we have covered musicians before. Um, we have? We have because we did the, the black metal episodes, but those guys are all kind of shitbags. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yes. yes and then yes. Uh, we covered a topic that was inspired by a band and those guys are awesome. Um, so I figured, you know what? <sighs> Let's talk about a couple of musicians that have something tragically in common. Um, little backstory. This started off as, um, I was going to, I had it narrowed down to like five bands or musicians that I was going to cover for this. Then I went, yeah, that's not going to work. That's, uh, that's too many. And then uh, one of them was like, well, shit, that's a, that, that would have to be its own full episode because there's so much information on it. So I narrowed it down to two because by proxy, the third one, you would have walked out partway through because, you know, you don't like John Denver. <laughs> um, but um, so we all have favorite musicians and bands and so on. And I bet many of us have had, you know, you know have a, a favorite artist that's no longer with us. Um, unfortunately, there's a. A lot of different ways that musicians die. Um, you know, uh, they seem to kind of repeat themselves between drug overdoses, um, getting shot in Las Vegas and having it never be solved. Uh, the Biggie and Tupac one. Um, and that's not who we're, that's not what we're covering now, because like I would have had to tell Kevin about that first and I would have needed help um, because that's a <laughs> that's a lot. Um, some, you know, some have died due to suicide. Um, others to potentially misguided deals with the devil, you know, like Robert Johnson, uh, who I think we also covered at one point in time. I think you covered him. No, I talked about him. I didn't cover him. I think he did. I thought he did him for a road trip episode. Ah, uh, maybe. I don't remember, man. Gosh, you know, this is kind of like at, like at that point, you know, where I'm kind of going. You got old uh, man brain that don't work no more anyway. Yeah, that's true. You're right. You're, you are 100% um, accurate. But the method of death that we are going to be talking about this week is plane crashes. Which um, I didn't realize. That, like, I looked up the number of people. looked up people that holy shit, dude. have died from plane crashes. and So many. Like, I only... What, there was like three or four that I didn't know. I think I think it was three or four. I didn't know had died that were that were uh yeah died in a plane crash but like I didn't know them personally right I didn't know, or not personally I didn't know of them right I mean like everybody knows about you know Richie Valens Big Bopper and Buddy Holly all dying on the same Fucking plane crash a three three and yeah. one boom um Leonard Skinner which was that was one that I was going yeah. to cover but that has to be its own episode because of how I did this where I did background on the artists and then how they died. Um, and of course there would, you know, I also had Stevie Ray Vaughn on my, my list, which like, that's another one that there's a lot that would go into that. John Denver also, um, who was playing in the mountain. Fucking so many, so many musicians have died in plane crashes. Yeah. Um, I mean, or, or you, you go, if, or yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. Just, just uh, man, I didn't know what like, what was it? Um, um, oh shoot, I, I saw one there on it on the list. Um, Patsy Klein. Yeah, I didn't know. Like, I mean, that she was like one of my grandmother's favorites, and I didn't know that she died in a plane crash. Yep, <laughs> dude, there's so many of them. Yeah, I was um, like, huh, and like. For these two guys, once we start talking about the planes that they crashed on, because they crashed on different, obviously they weren't on the same flight uh, or anything. They died years apart from each other. Mm -hmm. um, they were on different types of jets. Mm -hmm. But I get into a little bit of the statistics on each one of them, and they are flying coffins, mm -hmm. uh, especially the second one. Um, which, uh, when we get there, the body count for that particular model of plane has a comma in it. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and that's just from what I could find on Wikipedia about it. I didn't. Oh, wow. I didn't do a lot of deep digging as to into like the oh. numbers of people that have died on these particular kinds of planes. But um, this week we're going to talk about a couple of ultra talented, um, technically folk musicians, I guess you would you would call them, that flew a little bit too close to the sun, and the world is worse for it. Honestly, um, first one we're going to talk about is a guy that I grew up listening to with my dad in the truck. Um, I can, I can probably chalk up a lot of my weird ass taste in music, my old man. Cause like you could grab the, <laughs> you remember the old fucking cassette cases, like the yep. briefcases. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Some people out there might not know, but they had these old faux leather bound <laughs> briefcases that would hold like, uh, 30 or 40 cassettes in them. And cassettes were a thing that oh, were yeah. between eight tracks and CDs. You could rewind them, unlike an eight track. You had to listen that whole bitch through. You know, if somebody's like, "Wait, what did he say there?" You got to fucking listen all the way through and restart. Um, so I, I was gonna say that you can't really say they're between like, you know, seventy twos and forty fives, and no, no, you know, because forty like seventy twos are still around. But like technology wise, they fell between the eight track and the CD for a portable option yeah, yeah. for music. Well. Um, yeah, eight tracks weren't really so much portable. I mean, my dad had an old truck with an eight track player. Yeah, in but it, is but what I'm saying. Portable, like the cassette player was the first portable. Well, you know what I mean, like something that you could have in your vehicle because you didn't have a fucking record player in your truck. No, you know, no. But I'm saying the first portable of like being able to take it out of a vehicle was. I, I bet you could put a record player in a truck though if you had one, like an older vehicle with a cassette deck and you had the. The adapter, like what I have in my Toyota. Yeah. yeah. But I'm saying... It skipped like a motherfucker. Out, out, out of the vehicle <laughs> to, and into a box that you could play outside right. was... The first one was the cassette. Yeah. Because, I mean, the 8-track the player that we had at my parents' house was... Oh, my God. That thing was huge. You could move it from room to room, but it was, it was big. Um, we didn't... We had... One eight track player in my house, and that was part of an entertainment center. That was my mom's brother's, so my my uncle, who passed away, and it was part as as entertainment center. You know, I I and bet you, and I never actually listened to an eight track on it. I bet you, my dad still has his eight track player up in the closet in the in his computer room. I mean, it was it was probably like twenty four inches long by you know like twelve inches deep, and it probably weighed twenty pounds. It was huge. But yeah, because um, yeah. I think that came as a set with the record player that's in the basement in his wood shop, um, which I don't think he knows is even there, because the record player also had a fucking cassette player in it. And I guarantee you, if I were to go to my parents' house right now, plug that record player in and hit play on the cassette player, it is the Youper's greatest hits, which was... <laughs> That's a whole different kettle of fucking fish, because, you know, Grandma got run over by a reindeer and, you know, Rusty Chevrolet and all those oh, fucking so, classics. Okay, so my so my brother Jamie had that one, had one like that, but it was a dual cassette. Yep, dual cassette with a record player on top. But... It would run 45s and 72s. You could record, you could make a mixtape because the, because you could press play... While you're playing... And record a, uh, record record a blank it. on the other. Yes. No, I don't no, 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 no. Record a blank while re- while playing the 72 or 45. Oh, yeah, but you could also do it from cassette to from a cassette to yes. a blank. Yes, yes. Um, I don't think my dad's has that, but I I, I couldn't tell you. Um, you just press fucking... No, no, I don't, I don't know if his had a record option on it, is what I'm saying. Oh. Um, so, you know, you could flip this thing open, and you would have found everything from... Iron Maiden to Conway Twitty, Loretta Lynn, Johnny Cash, Will and Jennings, Leonard Skinner, Charlie Daniels, Metallica, Ray Charles, fucking Stevie Wonder, and of course, the guy that we're about to talk about, Jim Croce, who was a fucking staple at my house growing up. Um, See, he was born January 10th, 1943, to Italian immigrants, which I had no idea. I honestly, for the longest time, thought that he was half black, half white. Just because... I never really saw like uh, uh, color pictures of him, and I was like, I just, I just assumed that he was mixed, and uh, nope, nope. Um, and they're not even like 
Italian immigrants. They are fucking Sicilian. Uh, his father's name was James, and his mother's name was Flora. Um, and they came over here from Palermo in Sicily, um, which means that he had been born in the same time frame in New York, in New York City instead of South Philly. His career could have taken a completely different turn. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, had he been up there, he, you know, maybe he gets connected, he knows some guys, and he gets a couple of record deals earlier than he gets them, and, you know, who knows? Bada bing, bada boom. Correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's how it goes, you know. Uh, but, you know, thankfully, he, he went a different direction. Um, and he's absolutely no no dummy either. Uh, he graduated from high school in 1960, ends up at Villanova, where he studies, of all things, psychology with a minor in German. Oh. It's a strange combo, but hey. Okay. Whatever works. Um, he did take part in a few singing groups, um, and he was a, D- a student DJ at WKVU, which that station is still around. Um, it's the radio station based out of uh, University of Villanova. So he graduated in 1965 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Social Studies. Um, When he first starts out with music, he didn't really take it super seriously. Um, He was part of a group called the Villanova Singers, and they would play at, like, frat parties, coffee shops, um, other smaller colleges all around the area of Philadelphia. Um, They played everything from blues, rock, uh, railroad music, which I'm not real sure what exactly that would consist of. Um... When I heard when I first saw railroad music, I was like, "Is that like fucking Arlo Guthrie and stuff like that? Like old timey like American folk music?" I have no idea. I think so. I think it is. I think it's uh, you know, railroad music is a folk, yeah, folk music. And like, I I don't want anybody to to hear folk music and go, "Oh, it's a bunch of weird hippy dippy shit." No, it's Jim fucking Croce. Like if you've listened to anything he's ever recorded, it's all good. Yeah, well, I mean a lot of a lot of I. I sound a little bit racist but you know really it's not uh because i think a lot of it I, i'm if i'm if memory serves me correct and i'm correct when i say this so if i'm wrong please someone tell me mm-hmm. you know say correct me when i'm you know but i believe it was there's a lot of black folks that were um that did a lot of these songs. Oh, absolutely! That a lot of yeah. a lot of the railroad music. Yeah, like folk folk music and soul music are like are very very no, no, close. No, I'm, no, I'm what I'm saying, saying is like those. Music. But those two categories are very close to each other. So you would have a lot of crossover between people that would you know be doing both. But I'm talking railroad music because at the time there, it's like when, like a long time ago when it was done. Yeah, there was no soul music. It no, wasn't. But this was at this just point in time like, there would have been. Yeah, by this time, of course. I mean, fifties. Yeah, it was you know start of soul. I mean, shit. If you if you really want to look at it, um, the lead singer of Flogging Molly, uh, David King, considers his band to be a folk band. And I mean, they're kinda they're like more punk, but yeah, yeah. It, but whatever. And if you listen to either one of these guys, it's not what you're thinking of when you automatically like think of like stereotypical folk music. It's really not. Because um, folk music is more like telling a story. Yeah, and for, I mean, and they, they are telling stories, like both of these guys do. Um, but it's not the weird, like... It's not, it's not, like, Sabaton could I'm, be... I'm friends with the forest kind of folk music. It's not that. It's like, these are just like... No, but like, Sabaton could be, like, oh, you know, you could put that into a folk-ish style. Yeah, I guess. Because no, they're not, I guess. Because it they, is. They, it is, they're telling stories from history. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, historical metal is not really a thing, but, you know. I mean, if you want to go that route, you can also put Mastodon in there, too. True. Because that's all they do is tell stories. Wish I could actually have heard them. Oh, and, my God. And know what they, what they were saying. Right. You know, but I mean, whatever. Anyhow. Yeah. Uh, so he's got that sociology degree. Correct. Um, so all they're, they're playing all, these, all this different kind of music. Um, and... They win a contest where they're selected to do a, quote, foreign exchange tour, which basically means we're going to send you away from here to go play in, like, Europe and other places. Um, They played, like, Africa, the Middle East, Yugoslavia, and Jim said, quote, we just ate what the people ate, lived in the woods, and played our songs. Of course, they didn't speak English over there, but 
But if you mean what you're singing, people understand. Because music kind of transcends that shit. You know? Yeah. Um, well, he was in college. He met his future wife, a woman named Ingrid Jacobson. Uh, take a wild guess uh, what she probably looks like. She's probably like six feet tall and blonde. You know. Or brunette. Well. But anyway, he met her at uh, the whitest thing of all time, a hootenanny, which he was the judge at. Don't know what the fuck a hootenanny is. Didn't really look into it. I was just like, I can't believe that this didn't spell check me when I wrote it. So, <laughs> it's a word, I guess. It's a, yeah, it's a party. Party of some sort, yeah. Um, not quite a shindig. I think a shindig may be like, skirts are a little bit shorter to shindig, you know what I mean? Like, no. Shindig, hootenannies, they've been, same know. same thing. I think it's more like a southern thing. Mm-hmm. I think shindigs is where them, uh, you know, them, them people that don't go to church go. That's that. That's a shindig. Hootenanny is more like, you know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so, gonna say I'm gonna say that I think they're damn near close to the probably, same thing, or probably. they are the same thing. Just called two different things. Probably. I didn't look into it, like I said, so I couldn't tell you. Um, in 1966, Jim converted to Judaism before they got married, um, because his wife was Jewish, and that was kind of part of the deal where he had to convert or else they couldn't get married. Um. So, or she just had to convert to Catholicism. That's not how that works, though. It could. Yeah, it doesn't ever. But she's the male. Look she's, at, the, he's, she's the female. Doesn't matter. Look at Rod Crew. He did the same thing. You don't have to. They can, you know, switch switch teams too. Listen, you don't switch teams when you control the weather and have space lasers. You bring more in. Usually it's like just saying. Usually the conversion is, uh, you know, if you're a the male that's Jewish and the female that's something else, she converts, not the other way around. Yeah, but where does she convert to? Hell, converts to Judaism. <laughs> no, she converts. Uh, yeah, Judaism. But but if in are this we noticing case, a pattern there? But in this case, <laughs> she is Jewish mm-hmm. and he's. I'm gonna assume Catholic. Yes, because he's, you know, he's Italian. He's he's got the <laughs> he's got the you know yeah the thing, the hand gestures. Yeah, and the like I said, did you notice a pattern there? But he also makes an offer you can't refuse. You know? But did you notice how that worked though? His family is really good. Judaism wins, and it also, I mean, not to be that guy, but when you're going into the entertainment industry, it might help a little bit. No, 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 you're still your family, you know, disowns you. You know, no, well, no, not really. Because like, Catholic. no, I, I, I'll, we'll get there. Okay, so they get married. Um, 1966 is a busy year for Jim. Uh, he enlists in the National Guard in New Jersey, so that he can't get drafted to go fight in Vietnam. Um, <laughs> you gonna draft me? Fuck you! I'll just join. Um, he still could have been sent. It doesn't matter. But he didn't want to get drafted. Is the thing. Because if you got drafted, you were going, like, into, like, the big army or the Marines. And then you were actually, like, you are going if you get drafted. Yeah. If you join, they're like, eh, you're also in the National Guard, so you'll probably hang out here for a while. Um, so, where the fuck would I laugh off here? Um, he, he did have a little bit of an authority problem, so he ended up going through basic training twice. And then he left for active duty a week after his honeymoon. Um, on going through basic training twice, he said, quote, it prepared him if there was ever a war where he would have to defend himself with a mop. Uh, so later in that year, uh, he used the $500 wedding check that his parents had given him to release his first album, Facets. Um, the $500 covered studio time and releasing 500 copies of this album, which is crazy. That's a crazy amount of money. Five hundred dollars went a long way back in the sixties. Yeah, um, things were cheaper. Yeah, <laughs> but the reason that this happened is because mom and dad were kind of hoping, like, okay, if we let him get this out of his system and he fails, he'll just forget about it, and he'll get a real job and he'll put his education to use. Uh, so, unfortunately, though, he'll he'll he'll. He'll get divorced from that hussy that stole him away from our religion. <laughs> He'll marry a good Catholic girl. Yes. <laughs> bring uh, her, bring her back, 
bring them back to our wholesome religion, and it'll, everything will be wonderful. In all fairness, everything I've seen of, seen with her, she seems like a fucking sweetheart, though. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm just, um, I, you know, I'm just kind of saying, you know, it's one of those, <laughs> one of those hopes and dreams yeah. of every Sicilian mom and dad. Yeah. Oh, come on. Why don't you marry me? Really, really, why, oh, why you do this to me? Why? Why? <laughs> why? why? Um, so, unfortunately for Mr. and Mrs. Croce, old Jimbo here sells every single fucking copy of this album. And uh, from there, in the mid-60s to the early 70s, he uh, he and his wife were performing as a duo, um, covering songs by uh, people such as Gordon Lightfoot, Joan Baez, oh, wow. and Arlo Guthrie. Um, Gord- oh. Gordon Lightfoot's going to come up again to the next one, too. He did Arlo Guthrie, too? Yeah, cover it, yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Like, a l- I don't think a lot of that stuff got, got released, though, because it w- none of it was recorded. This was all just, uh, like, live gig stuff that they were doing covers. Um, and eventually, he did start writing his own music. Yeah. Um, gets his big break when he signs a long-term deal with the illustrious and very, very well-known Riddle Paddock, which is a steakhouse in Lima, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Not even a franchise, just the one. Um, 1968, the Croches. And it's mo- actually pronounced Lima. Lima. No, it's Lima, Ohio. It's Lima, Pennsylvania. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. I was just. I, I, I heard. Believe it. me, I went to school with a guy who moved to Lima, Ohio, and then got arrested for producing and selling child porn. Oh. And then wonders why doesn't anybody get a hold of me on Facebook? Because you're a fucking scumbag, piece of shit, pedophile, and I hope you get raped to death in prison. So in 1968, the Croches move. Um, to the Kingbridge area of the Bronx, and they record their first album with Capitol Records. Ooh, wow. Which is a big deal. Yeah, um, Capitol Records. Very big. They they started getting a little disheartened with the music business, and they sell all of their guitars, because he had a collection. He sold all of them except for one acoustic that he kept, and then they moved back to uh, um, Lydell, Pennsylvania. Uh, and Jim would play for 25 bucks a night at local bars, making a little extra cash. Um, to help alongside with his other full-time jobs that he was doing, like where he's driving truck, he's working construction, and he's giving guitar lessons on the side. Yep. Very busy dude trying to provide for his family. Uh, 1970, this is when things really change for Jim and the family here. He meets a guy named Maury Muleson, who is a classically trained musician and songwriter, and he meets him through an old friend from college named Joe... Oh, Jesus... I typed his name out. I never actually said it. Joe Savulio. It's a okay. Fairy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Irish. Yeah. <laughs> I thought so. I, with that name, I yeah. was like, sounds Irish I know, to me. I know a fucking Mick when I hear one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, one uh, from one, uh, you know, one... Uh, potato eater to another I mean. <laughs> uh, so oddly enough when these two first started performing together jim was the uh, was the guitarist and backup singer which completely blows my mind to think of jim croce as a fucking backup singer to anyone yeah because you know again he's jim croce and i've never heard of this other guy until i started researching um so eventually the roles flip uh Mielsen, uh begins start you know starts playing lead guitar and Jim's pl- uh, you know playing rhythm and singing as he would and this is also the year that uh, that him and his wife find out that they're having a, a, a child and right then once he finds out his wife is pregnant Jim goes full blast focusing on music huh no sorry I, I was I'm sorry I, I, I was kind of like looking up songs and you know trying to uh Oh, we're going to go into songs. No, I was trying to look up songs. I was like, okay, wait. You know, what he's saying what, while you were talking, just so I could be like, yeah, yeah, okay. Because I was trying to remember that. And then Gordon Lightfoot, I was like, wow, why the hell? Why is it? Okay. Dude, I know Gordon, song. Li- Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song about something that we could potentially do an episode on, too. We could, yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And I was just like, oh, boy. And that's another dude that never released a bad fucking song. Didn't it's really like, release too many, but, but doesn't matter. He was awesome. It's like, anyway, um, so he's he is full blast focused on making music his career now. He sends a cassette of a bunch of original songs to, uh, to the production team of Tommy West, 
who would also go on to play drums, piano, keyboard, and do backup vocals for Jim when he starts recording in albums, and uh, Terry Cashman, who are in New York City. Mm. His old buddy Joe, that set, that hooked him up with his new buddy Maury, he just so happens to work at the record studio where these two guys are. And he's like, he walks by and he's like, hey, so that Jim, what's his last name? Yeah, yeah, that guy. I heard you playing some of him. He's pretty good. You should maybe give him a chance. Like, just kind of played it off real smooth. Like, you know, I'm not going to let him know that I went to college with this guy and we're buddies. Uh-huh. I'm going to try to uh-huh. gonna try to help him out. Um, he does put a good word in for him. And the Croshies would end up welcoming their son, AJ, which is Adrian James, on September of uh, 1971. Um uh, and at this point in time, Ingrid stops, completely stops touring with him, recording with him and stuff, because she has a more important job to do. Me, mom. She's mom. The big year comes in 1972, where he signs a three-record deal with ABC Records, um, which you've probably never heard of. No. No. Um, you've probably heard of some of the people that they had under contract, though, at one point in time or another. Um those would be, you know, like Ray Charles, Crosby and Nash before they found Stills, Steppenwolf, Lee Von Helm, Louis Armstrong, and John Lee Hooker. That's just like a very short list of other of other acts that were contractually obligated to ABC Records. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of a lot of music right there. Huh. Um, this is huge for Jim's family. Uh, the two albums released that year, um, they have some huge hits on them. That got a lot of playtime on radio stations around the world, um, including uh, one of one of my absolute favorites that he did. You don't mess around with Jim, which reached number eight on the Billboard Top 100 in 1972. Um, he released uh, Operator, Photographs and Memories, Rapid Roy, the Stock Car Boy, which is also another good one, but it's not like one of his better known ones. But it's fun. Yeah. Um, and these were just off of the album You Don't Mess Around With Jim, which came out in April of 1972. That's just like a couple a couple of his best songs were on this one fucking album. Yeah. Um, his second album, Life and Times, came out January of 1973, which also has some really good songs on it, like uh, one, uh, one Less Set of Footsteps, It Doesn't Have to Be That Way, and his first number one hit on the Billboard Top 100, which was Bad Bad Leroy Brown. Yep. Which uh, I think at some point through here, I'm going to end up putting a little bit of that in the show, like underneath, just so you can, you can hear it. Because uh, yeah. you know, if you've never heard that song, first of all, how fucking dare you? Second of all, pause this and go listen to a bunch of Jim Croce and then come back and listen to the rest of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's good. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, of course, you know, who hasn't heard that song? You have I mean, to. <laughs> you have you have to. They're, they're so good. Um, August 1st, 1972, he makes his national TV debut on American Bandstand, Ooh, which wow. was a big fucking yes. deal. Yes, um, very much. Beatles have been on American Bandstand. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see, who else? Um, you name it. They've probably been on mm-hmm. it. And this is a big deal, especially back in a time when, you know, musicians had actual talent and didn't need a group of 20 to 30 people to write their songs um, about, you know, an ex-boyfriend or being some sort of sexual deviant of some type. You know, this is just one dude writing songs. It's like when you look at, like, anything that fucking Nicki Minaj has recorded where they've got 20 to 30 people that wrote a song and it's like the same 12 words over and over again. And then you look at anything that Queen ever recorded... And you realize, holy shit, that was all Freddie Mercury writing that. Not one. They were all guys in the band. They didn't have outside writers. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Well, you said only Freddie Mercury, which was not true. A lot of their bigger songs were just him. Another one, Bites the Dust, was not him. That was him and Brian May. But again, they're in the fucking band. Those are the people that should be writing the music for the band. Are the people in the fucking band. I know. Or you have John Fogarty, who had to... Literally had to sue himself to use his own music that he wrote after he left Creedence uh, Clearwater Revival. I know. Which is fucking crazy. (laughs) Would you have to file a lawsuit where you are the plaintiff and the defendant at the same time to get the rights to your music is is wild. But again, yeah, this is back when musicians actually had talent, though. uh, Unlike um, the last... 
30-ish years, I would say. No, no, maybe not that far. That's like 15, probably. I mean... Yeah. There, there's still some eh. people out there that write their own shit. Very few. But, I mean, also, they were, they were back in the 70s, 80s. People were writing for other people, too. Correct. But music nowadays all sounds the same, too, which is a huge problem. It all has the same setup to it with the same, like, it's got to have a catch. It's got, to, like, this, that, the other, and it's all the same. And most of it is not even recorded by actual musicians. It's done on fucking computers. So. I thought the same fucking thing back in, back in like, the 80s and 90s. Because I had to listen to a lot of country, and I thought every single bit of country sounded, like, the same. Yeah. And like, that's what I keep telling. <laughs> that's, that's where I fall on country music. There has not been, like, man... But the last really, really good writer for country music was fucking George Strait. After, like, everything in the last, like, 10 to 15 years, even in country, all sounds the same. And it's not good. I mean, I, I will say I have found some of the new stuff that I really like. It's not, doesn't sound the same, you know. And most of it is guys that are taking influence from older stuff like Johnny Cash where they're like well everything sounds like this so I should probably go back a little bit and start recording stuff that sounds like this and those are the ones that aren't bad you know well, yeah like Sturgill Simpson who's fucking awesome I, I listen to all of his stuff he's good but like a lot of it is still just perfect example for people that I can't fucking stand that are hugely popular is Luke Bryan Jesus Christ I can't fucking stand him all of his songs sound exactly the same they're all the same they're all the same. I don't really like Luke Bryan's Ugh. song, so I'm not really like, God. you know, I'm a more of like some of the, the newer, you know, some of the newer guys I kind of like because they don't all, they don't sound the same at all, you know, yeah, I, I, it's just Kane Brown guy doesn't, I don't. It's not I really mean, country though. Yeah, it is. It's really not. It is. It's fucking city country. It's not. I saw. I said the same goddamn thing, with when I heard uh, 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 Indian Outlaw by fucking uh, Tim McGraw. I heard. I said the same thing. Yeah, it's so. I mean, I, I, know, I'm not gonna sit here but, and defend you know, Tim McGraw because he sucks too. But Tim McGraw, <laughs> no, I mean, no, <laughs> I, I, I don't fucking like Tim McGraw. Well, like, that's that's your opinion and opinions. That's you know, yeah, that's fine. Has their own, that's fine. That's what know? I'm saying. It's like I don't, I don't like him. I mean, particularly so. But like any, well, like, but still, some of the stuff like Jim Karoshi's period, I can't fucking stand. I don't fucking like half of it. Yeah, that's fine. To, like for specific points in time in music, you don't have to like all of it, but there's definitely artists that you should. You know? I, I, and my, he is, I he is should, one of them. I should, but I don't. He is one of them that that you that everybody you should know. like though because he was fantastic. I like one of his songs, "Bad Blood." The that's Air it. Brown. That's it. Really? Yep. You don't you, you don't like like you me, you don't mess around with Jim or any of those. No, really. Wow. Nope. Hmm. <laughs> I am very much a uh, like. Okay, I'll take that one, and then I'll take that one. You know, I'm I'm a pick and choose from. Uh, but that's part of music. You're supposed to be able to pick and choose what songs. Like even nowadays, I don't I don't fucking follow every goddamn artist. Metallica. Another Dude, Metallica example. hasn't been good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's been a minute, man. Like, um, if, if, if I had a time machine and I could go back and change one event in history, I would tell Cliff Burton and, you know, like, hey, Lars is going to try to talk into tra uh, trading beds on the bus. Don't fucking do it. Let him die instead. Because guess what? A drummer, especially of that caliber, is a whole lot fucking easier to replace than Cliff Burton was. Yeah, but I mean... Yeah. And also, Lars Ulrich is a giant bitch. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. You have all this money and you're going to bitch about people downloading your stuff on Napster? Fuck you. Fuck you. Somebody, Bitch about it from your pool. The thing is, somebody bought it and then they downloaded it. So, I mean, whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's you just, guys are ruining music. No, fuck you. You ruined that entire band. Well, they didn't ruin music because, you know, they, look at them now. They, they no, no, no. I'm still he, he was saying Na Napster was ruining no, music. They didn't ruin music. Yeah. They're still, this band is still just as popular. Everybody knows who, 
Metallica is. They're they're more popular now because of fucking Stranger Things. You know, there there's bands out there still just as popular. You know, because of whatever doesn't. I don't know. It's just that age old thing of you know. Oh, you're doing this. You're doing this. Yeah, they're ruining this. Yeah, he's a cunt. Well, like, well, but I mean, I don't know. Here's another one that that I know people will give me shit for that I cannot stand. Pink Floyd. Don't like any other shit. I do. They were around at the same time as Led Zeppelin, so like they don't matter to me. Well, see, there's a thing. It's just like the Beatles and Rolling Stones. Yeah, either, I, yeah. either you were you were a Rolling Stones fan or you were a Beatles fan, or you were a Iron Maiden fan because it was all in the same Dif- time frame. Different music. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not a big fan of either one of those two that you just mentioned. But dif- totally different music. And like honestly, I, I Iron really, Maiden I was actually like stand- a lot. Of no, his... I'm, I'm sorry. I meant uh, Black Sabbath because uh, Black Sabbath was around at the same time as. Black you know. Sabbath was like seventies. Yeah, and so were the Beatles. Beatles and were Pink like, Floyd. yeah, but they were like they were in the late, like mid sixties into the seventies. Stones, yeah. Beatles were like fifties in, you know, and yep. beyond. So they Stones and Beatles were like, you know, they compared, and you were either one or the other. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, your Black Sabbath or your fucking Pink Floyd or yeah. you know, and then there's Keith Richards who like. Adam and Eve show up and they're like, who the fuck's this guy? And God's like, I don't know. He was here when I got here too. So <laughs> he's got some white stuff on his lip. But he, about he has preserved himself. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but still it's like, you know, it's, I don't know. It's either you like it or you don't like it. And yeah, but you know, it's, no. it's, it's a give, or, give or take. Yeah. Um, so August 11th, 1972, um, oh, that's when he hits American Bandstand. Again, that's where this whole conversation derided yeah. from. Um, from there, Croce begins uh, touring the United States with his with his crew. Um, they're performing in, like, co- like, larger coffee houses. They're playing on, like, college campuses, folk festivals. They're doing, like, uh, small, like, local, um, mm-hmm. like, event centers and shit like that. Anything where you can put chairs, basically. And, uh, however, his financial situation remains less than optimal. Uh, the record company had fronted him the money to record a couple of albums. And, um, a lot of that went to paying advances for like venues and stuff. So he doesn't have any money. He's making no money at this point, even though he does have a number one song that's on the charts. Um, 1973 Croce and Milson, um, travel to Europe, performing in London, Paris, Amsterdam, Monte Carlo, um, Zurich, and Dublin, and they receive a lot of a lot of positive reviews. He uh, comes back and he makes television appearances on uh, the show Midnight Special, um, which he co-hosted on June fifteenth, uh, June fifteenth, and the Helen Reddy show on June ni- uh, July nineteenth. No, Johnny Carson. No, really. No, not, no. Wow. Um, his big single, uh, Bad Bad Leroy Brown, reaches number one on the American charts in July. And from July 16th through August 4th, uh, they returned to London and prefer, uh, perform on the old gray whistle test. Don't. Couldn't. I, I ain't got a fucking blues clue what that is. I'm sure one of our English listeners could fill us in, but I have no clue Not what the clue. hell that is. Huh. Um, and... Um, he finishes recording uh, the album, um, which was uh, uh, the second one, Life and Times. Finishes recording uh, recording that um, just a couple of weeks before he died. Uh, so while on tour, uh, Croce is starting to get homesick, and he decides he's going to take a, a break from music after the tour is done. At this point, he had like eight or nine shows left, and he's going to go home and hang out with his wife and son. And just kind of lay low and figure out if he wants to keep doing it or not. Yeah. Thursday, September 20th, 1973. And we have an exact date, so that's probably not a good thing, right? Uh, Jim Croce and his crew board the Beechcraft E-18S that had been chartered for them to take off from the Natchitoches Airport in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Um, so before we go too much further... Uh, these planes and just like people in general don't mix well. Um, the same exact model, 
crashed in Lake Monona in Wisconsin, which was carrying Otis Redding and his band The Bar in 1967. Otis Redding, also kind of a bad motherfucker. Had a lot of good songs. Um, yep. <laughs> My favorite um, songs of all time. Another one of these crashes, also in 1967, but this time in Saudi Arabia. Um, this one killed a man by the name of Mohammed bin Awad bin Al Laden. Um, I'm sorry, bin Laden. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 that guy's dad. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, the one that uh, all of a sudden people are treating as a fucking folk hero for some reason. Who? Osama bin Laden. What? Yeah, dude, TikTok got a hold of one of his, his like, some asshole on TikTok got a hold of one of his fucking letters that he wrote to the United States after. Oh, I read it. Yeah, and they're like, oh, he's kind of a hero. And I'm like, you're kind of. It's not he's a hero. Uh, I will say this about it. Very well written. Sure. Um, very well spoken. Uh, very, very learned man. Okay, so was Ted Kaczynski. Um, yeah, I, I'm not taking anything away from, no, <laughs> I'm not taking it away from, I'm not saying he's, you know, wasn't a, a monster, either one of them, just saying, if you go based on, if you just looked at something that somebody wrote, you didn't know nothing about that person at all, and just knew, so you read something that they wrote, you'd have been like, holy shit, man, this guy's a very fluid, you know, well-written, well, well-read well person in life must be must have been blah 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 yeah know? sure but you know who he is because you were born here i'm saying but if you didn't know eventually in time there's gonna be someone who doesn't know who osama bin laden that'd be is. like getting a hold of one of hitler's speeches and being like yeah this is pretty well done and not knowing who the fuck adolf hitler was well i mean if we stop talking about world war ii you know stop teaching it in class uh you're not gonna know mm -hmm. but i mean you know we don't teach. They don't teach about you know, uh, Al Qaeda and and not uh, yet the Taliban and stuff like that. So you don't. Eventually, people, kids won't know who Osama bin Laden is. Yeah, could you imagine being the parent of like some like eighteen year old kid that's reading this and goes, "Hey, Dad, check this out. Look at th this guy's got some really good points." And you look at it and read it and go, "No, fuck you. You're grounded," because you know who it is and like because the school system didn't explain who that is. I don't think I would crown my kid. I would inform my child. I'd be like, listen, this guy was an asshole. And they'll so. be like, what do you mean, Dad? <laughs> and then you go, and then you show them, you know. You point things out to them, say, hey, go look at this, look no. this up. Power of the internet. Well, unfortunately, uh, Osama, uh, Osama had escaped his nutsack before his father died. Um, well, yeah, because he was already born. Yeah, that's what I just said. He escaped his nutsack before I that. I mean, Jesus Christ. What, he was born in like 40-something. What year was this? This was 67. No, that he... That, that his father died, died in 67, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, because it was only like not even less he, than He was in years. his 20s at this point in time because he was around the same age as... Uh, less than 20 years from now, he's fucking fighting uh, uh, the Russians. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He was, he was in his uh, late teens, early 20s at that point in 67. Because he's around the same age as, um, fuck, I can't remember the guy's name that we covered. Um, the guy who should have been the president of yeah. Afghanistan had he yeah, not yeah, been yeah. assassinated. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so, Kroshi's flight is taking off just about an hour after he finishes his, uh, his show at Northwestern State University's Pray Their Coliseum. Um, Hold on, say that again? Northwestern University. Pray their Coliseum. <laughs> okay. I had, I'm like, why are we praying for their Coliseum? Mm. <laughs> I'm, <in. laughs> uh, um. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, <their> Coliseum. <laughs> so he was supposed to be flying from here to Sherman, Texas to do a show at Austin College. Uh huh. Which is not. Austin it's. G. Well, <laughs> so that it's not the University of Texas at Austin where the shooting was from the, the clock tower. This is Austin University. It's yeah. a different different school. Apparently. I'm sorry, Austin College. So now that we got the stage set on the plane, we have Jim Croce, Maury, uh, Maury Muleson, uh, a comedian by the name of George Stevens, who I've never heard of. The 
old 60s, 70s comedian. Never heard of him. Um, Croce, uh, Croce's managers, Kenneth Cortez and Dennis Rast. Um, and the plane is being flown by Robert Elliott. And to show that this is not Robert Elliott's first rodeo, uh, not only did he own his own business where he leased planes to fly people because he was a pilot and didn't want to work for a big airline. Um, and also the other thing is, is like the pilot is always seen as the bad guy in situations like this, where there's a crash. Um, so he had a total of 14,290 flying hours and he had 2,190 hours on type, which from what I gather means that that's like, I think there's like different certifications on your pilot license, like there is on your driver's license, Fuck if for I like know. different types of, of craft, um, and I think that's what this is, because this isn't this plane isn't like, it's not a Cessna, it's not a seven forty seven, it's like a mid size where it's like thirty to fifty people ish kind of kind of okay. plane. Um, so it's it's a Lear jet. Oh no, it's bigger than a Lear, Ish. bigger than a Lear, because a Lear is you know you know, 10, 15 people. This was like, uh, this, this is a, a bigger plane. This, this was like 30 to 40 seats. Okay. Um, actually, hold on here. I can get up. I whip up a picture of this thing. Cause it's a fuck. Where was it here? Yeah. So it's not, it's not a huge plane. It's, it's just like a, like a midsize passenger plane. Yeah. It's be like Learjet size. No. Okay, so according to the BAAA, which is the Bureau of Aircraft Accidents Archives, this is the official story, directly from them. Shortly after takeoff from Natchitoches Airport, by night in foggy conditions, the airplane failed to gain sufficient height when it struck a tree located 590 feet past the runway and then crashed. The aircraft was destroyed and killed all six occupants on impact. Um, an investigation by the NTSB, which is the National Transportation Safety Board, I know that one by fucking heart because of spending a half a decade working in car dealerships, um, they showed more than likely cause was, quote, pilot failure to see the obstruction resulting from physical impairment and fog that had reduced his vision. No F shit. 57-year-old <laughs> Elliot suffered from severe coronary artery disease in his run of three miles to the airport from his motel before the flight is most likely a contributing factor. No. There's fucking fog. He had a heart condition, then he also ran three fucking miles from his hotel to the plane. Once again. Fog. It was a contributing factor. He probably had a heart attack mid-air also. From some of the things that they found when they did autopsies and stuff, they're like, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh. Because, like, you have a, a heart condition like that, and most likely with that you have high blood pressure. You put a lot of stress on it like that, and that can fuck with your vision. You know, it strains your vision and doesn't help that it's also foggy. Um, he had an ATP, uh, certi uh, certifi an ATP certificate, 1,400, 200, uh, 1,400, 200. 14,290 hours total flying and 2,190 hours on the Beach 18 type aircraft. A later investigation placed the sole blame on pilot error resulting from disorientation following his downward takeoff into a, quote, black hole um, known to cause sensory illusions in aviation. Jim Croce was 30 years old when he died. Like, I didn't realize he was that young. Um, I also didn't know he died in a fucking plane crash until I started looking into this stuff. Um, he left behind his wife and very young son. Um, and like most other musicians and artists that die really young, he wasn't really appreciated as much while he was alive. Um, a perfect example of that is, well, ABC had not originally released the song Time in a Bottle, which is another fucking fantastic song. Um, they'd never released it as a single. His untimely death... And the lyrics of the song, they were like, yeah, we should probably put this out because it deals with like mortality and trying to split time between your career and your family and all that. So it, it made sense um, to release it. Uh, the song subsequently received a large amount of airplay as an album track and uh, demand for a single 
was you know was there, so they released it as a single as well. Um, when it was eventually released, uh, I'm sorry, issued as a seven inch, it became Croce's second and final number one hit, um, and it finished its two week run on the top of the charts early in ju- uh, early in January 1974. Um, and then the album "You Don't Mess Around with Jim" became number one for five weeks, um, and that was about seven weeks after its release. Um, yeah, he, he, all of his songs after he died just fucking shot up the charts because he's dead, you know. Um, so I think we're right here. We're going to take a super quick break and come back and talk about a Canadian. Okay. So there's a little bit of backstory to explain how I came across this guy in the first place. Um, and he's, he's to this day considered one of, one of Canada's best songwriters and, uh, and singers in general. Um, considering this is the same country that produced people like Neil Young, Gordon Lightfoot, Getty Lee from Rush, Gord, uh, Gord Downey from the Tragically Hip... And as much as people want to say they fucking hate the band, Chad Kroger from Nickelback is also Canadian. They all are. Um, Celine Dion. Yeah, but like people that that hate Nickelback, they hate them for the same reason people hated Creed. It's because it got super overplayed. Because like Creed's coming back now, but it's you fucking hated it because it was like every ten minutes on the radio, you're getting the same song, and you're like I hate these guys it's just because you know uh, whatever yeah it is what it is and let's let, let's let's call it what it is nickelback got their big break playing at fucking piggy's palace which was robert picton's bar on his farm where he was killing prostitutes and feeding them to pigs so they won't tell you that in the in the fucking albums though will they um and i'm not making that up that's that's a real thing I have no fucking clue. <laughs> uh, anyway, long story short, one day at work, I'm listening to uh, Flogging Molly, you know, as I do. There's a playlist on either, like, this is pre-Spotify, so it would have been, like, Pandora or Amazon Music or some shit like that. Um, and as, like, you hit these playlists work, it's like, you don't get all just one artist, you get other shit sprinkled in. And this other band comes on called The Longest Johns, which is a, a British group that does, like, sea shanties and shit. So I'm like, I'm gonna listen to this, too, because... I have to. Uh, and I've actually mentioned them on an episode over on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Dark Windows Podcast, uh, the Halifax Explosion episode. They wrote a song about that, which was pretty fucking good. I believe I played it at the end of it, too. So you know, five, yeah. five bucks and you can go check it out. You can listen to the song for free, but then you can also, you know, pay us and listen to the episode, which was pretty good. Yeah. You know. Um, and from there... Another band comes up, Canadian band called the Dreadnoughts, which um, if you've never heard of them, holy shit, like picture a punk band and a polka band get cat like kidnapped by pirates. And then they just start making music that sounds like all three of those things. It's they're fucking awesome. It's a punk band with accordions where they're doing sea shanties. Okay, dude. Fantastic. Hmm. Fucking fantastic. Um, so they have a song called Dear Old Stan, which is a story of how the band kind of came together and the inspiration that the lead singer took from listening to Stan Rogers with his parents as a kid. Um, so from there, obviously I'm like, who the fuck's this Stan Rogers guy, right? So I start listening to that and he has become a staple at Fortress DWP. Um, I listen to Stan Rogers a lot when I'm in the basement, like doing any kind of woodworking, which I haven't done in a long time and I probably should. Um, then pretty much every night we walk into Declan's room with him and it's, hey, Alexa, play Stan Rogers. And he fucking falls asleep to it every night. And I've also mentioned Stan on here before. So if you go back to the Franklin's Lost Expedition episode that we did about that absolute shit show disaster that that whole thing was where uh, Franklin got a bunch of guys killed because they were on their way from their ship that was locked in the ice and he went, my monogrammed slippers and he made his fucking guys turn around to go back and get a bunch of his shit out of the ship and then they died yeah because uh, he was an asshole um so he wrote a song called northwest passage which was inspired by that um he puts it a lot more eloquently than i just did though uh-huh because <laughs> you know? he's not like us oh, fucking dickhead 
<clears throat> getting his crew killed over silverware. Yeah. Yeah. After they ate a bunch of fucking rotten canned food and probably got ergotism or whatever. And yeah. So anyway, Stanley Allison Rogers was born November 29th, 1949 to Nathan and Valerie who moved to Ontario from the Maritimes. They weren't specific as to which, which province, whether it was, you know, Prince Edward Island, uh, Newfoundland, Newfoundland. I'm going to guess most likely, I'm going to guess most likely Nova Scotia considering, you know, he spends most of his summers in Nova Scotia with family. Um, but they moved to Ontario looking for work, uh, the same, the, the year before Stan was born. Um, then as he's growing up, they, you know, they're spending most of their summers and stuff in a place called Guysboro County, which is in Nova Scotia, um, where if you look at Nova Scotia, it's weird to say because it's a strangely shaped island, but it's in like the bottom half of the northeastern corner of the main chunk of land there. Um, it's like 200 some odd miles from Halifax. So it's, it's a little ways from there, a couple hours from Halifax. Um and Nova Scotia was a huge inspiration and influence on his music because of the ethnic heritage of Nova, Sco- uh, Nova Scotia, where it's Scottish, Irish, just seafaring folk. Yeah. You know, telling ocean stories and stuff. Um, and it's, it's also... A, it's just a mix mash, just like everywhere else. Yeah. And it's also chock full of, like, every other person that works there, that lives there, is in the fishing industry. Because that's the only... You know, um, the one that blew my mind, though, is uh, I came across a dude on uh, one of like an Instagram short where uh, these it's these two dudes that do a podcast. One of them is Irish. The other one is from Newfoundland. And if you are not looking at them when they're talking, you can't tell which one's which because the accents are so fucking close. <laughs> it's wild because like the the dude from Newfoundland, it's got a little bit more. It, it's it's more Canadian, but other than that, it's it's really fucking close accent wise. It's weird. Hmm. Um, uh, so from stories that w- that you know come out from his childhood, he started singing pretty much almost immediately after he learned how to talk. Um, and his uncle Lee got him a handmade like little kid's guitar for Christmas when he was like four or five years old. Um, so his uncle also had a lot of influence on his music because you know they'd be hanging out at you know, family gatherings and stuff. And he's playing guitar and he's singing old country songs and stuff like that. Um, so it kind of, that's where his, his flavor of music grew from. Um, his first bandmate would be his younger brother, Garnet, who was six years younger than him. And they spent a lot of time as they were, you know, as kids, just, you know, playing different instruments, singing, fucking, (laughs) fucking around in the garage. Um, and during his high school days, he met some other kids in his age, age range, age range um, that were really into like folk music and all this which was kind of new for Stan because he was more like a he was more like a rock and roll guy he was playing bass in a couple of different bands um, including one that was called uh, Stanley and the Living Stones and my personal favorite of his high school bands The Hobbits which makes no sense to me because he was like 6 foot 5 he was a big dude like so it's like you imagine, you know, like, ah, oh, we're the hobbits. Like, motherfucker, you are enormous. Huh. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> um, but I'm sure he had a, a, a thing for, you know, Tolkien and all that stuff, which probably had a little bit of influence in the music, too. Probably. With the storytelling of it. Um, so from here, he spent a bit of time in McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and then uh, Trent University in Petersboro, which is also in Ontario. Um, and very similar path to Jim Croce. They're playing at coffee houses, small local concert halls, you know, student gatherings and stuff like that. Anywhere, the, anywhere they could get people and play music at the same time they were going to play. Um, in 1970, Stan signs a, a record deal with RCA records. And his first two single uh, singles he recorded were, uh, here's to you, Santa Claus and the fat girl rag, which I listened to that second one. And I'm like, as you're listening to it, it almost sounds like he's talking about a truck, but it's about a girl built like a truck. It, okay. It's fucking strange. It's it's not, you know, yeah. it's it's odd. Um, 
1973, he recorded three more singles, this time for a, a record company called Polygram. Um, heard of them as well? I've heard of our, both RCA and Polygram. Yep. Our, our, I think RCA is still around. I'm not sure the Polygram is, but... Um, Probably not. So these songs were uh, Three Pennies, Guysboro Train, and Past 50. Um, after a few more years of just writing and recording, he puts out his first full-length album, Fogarty's Cove, which is fucking awesome. Uh, that one comes out in 1977 on Barnswallow Records, which you've never heard of. No. Nope. And there's a reason you've never heard of that that company. Um, and again, in my personal opinion, this dude never released a bad song. I, I, I've listened to just about everything he's ever recorded that's been released, and I, I like all of it. Um, but his first album did so well in Canada and national, like internationally that he bought Barnswallow Records out and created his own uh, his own uh, record company. Okay. Um, one of my personal favorite songs off of this uh, off of this album is something that's been covered. It's a song that's been covered by um, Ale Storm, which is fucking a pirate metal band who are really good. Uh, the Longest Johns and another Canadian punk band called The Real Mackenzies, and that song is called Barrett's Privateers. And it's a, she, uh, a sea shanty describing the crew of the Antelope and their captain, El Cid Barrett, who fucked around and found out when they're trying to chase down an American ship um, doing some crown-backed piracy back in the 1700s. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have no fucking clue. Dude, it's a good song. It's a good song. And they, it, again, it's it's the perfect example of, uh, of, of fucking around and finding out the hard way. Yeah. Um, because they're on this, like, shitty old like fishing boat that's been outfitted with with cannons and stuff um they come across a big american sloop that's really really slow and they're like it's got to be full of gold right so they chase it for three days and they start shooting at it and they're like the fuck are you doing and they just turn and blow them out of the water essentially Hmm. um and the 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 point of view that he's singing from is a younger dude that loses both of his legs during the battle um it took six years for him to get from uh, like the British colonies in the Caribbean to fucking Halifax <laughs> by sea because they got fucked up. Okay. Um, uh, and again, this album did so well that he ended up buying out Barnswallow Records and he folds it into the company that he created called Fogarty's Cove. Um, he did all of this during the second, the recording of his second album called Turnaround, um, which comes out in 1978. Um, then in 1979, he puts out his first live album, which is called Between the Breaks Live, um, which featured uh, the Mary Ellen Carter, which is a song about a ship that sinks in one of the Great Lakes. Um, the ownership gives up on it because they got the insurance money. The ship's not damaged that badly, so the crew get fucking wasted, and they come up with a plan to refloat the ship, get it to dock, repair it, and sell it for money. Okay. Again, much better story than what I'm what I'm telling. July of 1979, Stan and his wife Ariel uh, welcomed their first and only son Nathan, um, who would go on to be a singer and songwriter in his own right. Um, and I did watch some of his stuff, and it, it's it's weird how much he looks and sounds like his dad, because uh, a lot of musicians you don't really have that with. Like when you look at like a father son, like for example, Hank Williams and Hank Williams Jr. They don't really look or sound all that much alike. No. If you take Hank Williams Jr. out and you put Hank the Third in there, he looks a lot like his grandfather and sounds a lot like his grandfather. Yeah. Um, but Jr. was just like, yeah, where the fuck he fit into that puzzle? I have no idea. Well, I mean, Jr. was like, he, 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 I mean, his mom made him play his father songs right. for so long. Right. And then he's like, you know, finally he was like, no, nah, nah. I got beer and cocaine. I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah, I'm going I'm to do my own <laughs> thing. And, you know, and, and I'm, I am, I'm not saying a bad word at all about Hank Williams Jr. Because like, I can't, I mean, contractually, I can't because like, I, I just can't. There, there's, there's no bad words that I can say about Hank Williams Jr. No, I mean, <laughs> Jesus know? Christ, he writes a song about, you know, called Family Tradition. Oh, I mean, God, Jesus Christ. so many good ones. But, like, uh, like now, well, uh, 
uh, I just heard him. The leads, the, uh, what's his name from, um, um, Sublime. Uh, oh my God. Bradley. His, his yeah. song, his, yeah. his son sounds so much like him. He looks like him too. Not really. He, but he looks enough like him that you can go, yeah, I see it. Yeah. I mean, you know? but still, he sounds like God a father. Damn. And everybody was like, man, I can't wait to go see Sublime with Rome. And I'm like, fuck that guy. Yeah, no. No, I want to see Sublime with Junior. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And they're touring again. Yep. And uh, I guess part of the part of him touring was he told the guys, he's like, listen, there's no drinking and there's no fucking drugs. We're doing this right. And they're like, all right, cool. They're also all in their fucking 50s. Like, it's. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean. You guys aren't Guns N' Roses. No, oh. I mean, they were, they're, you know, but he's like, you know, hey, let's let's play my dad's songs. and They have songs. to. What else can they play? New songs? No, you're sublime. You play the fucking classics. Of you don't course. you don't come up with new shit at that point. Come on. Yeah. You think ACDC is going to go on tour and just be like, yeah, so this is a song off one of our new albums. And people are going to be like, I don't care. I'm back in black or something like I. You guys, you guys are still recording new music. What the fuck are you doing? No, they're not. <laughs> no. Um, actually, another one that looks a lot like his dad is uh, Shooter Jennings. Him and Waylon are, like, they're similar enough that you can definitely tell that, you know, it's father and son. Um, but they don't sound alike. They don't sound alike, but they, you know. There was a rumor for a while that, that Shooter Jennings and Hank Williams III were going to do a, an album together where they were going to record just, like, their family's stuff. Like, God. That would have been fucking awesome. They did record together. They did, but... But yeah. they didn't, you know... Yeah, that would have been good. Right? Just covering, like, their dad's and grandfather's music and shit. Oh, man. I'd have been all about that. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. Um, 1981, uh, North the album Northwest Passage releases, and the title song that he wrote, again, about Franklin's Lost Expedition, um, is one of his most famous songs that he's ever put out. Um, his final album from... Uh, uh, called For the Family would release a couple of weeks again a couple of weeks after he died in 1983 June 2nd 1983 Stan is on an Air Canada flight from Dallas Texas where he had performed at the Kerrville Folk Festival I had no idea what the hell this was so I was like let's let's look into it because it's got to be something right this is like a a, a, a pretty good sized festival actually consisting of like folk bluegrass and country music um and it's kind of a competition based thing where the year that he was there about 800 singer songwriters bands whatever all sent stuff in to the organizers and from there it's narrowed down to between 30 and 40 from 800 okay um and all of the contestants are brought to the festival over the first couple of days, they would each do like play like a two song set and it all had to be originals. It, you couldn't do covers. It had to be all stuff that you had written and recorded yourself. Um, and from there, it's narrowed down to six finalists who would receive cash prizes like staggered from, you know, six down to one, whatever, um, with the winner getting a 20 minute set on the main stage. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of a big deal, because at that point in time, once you have your six finalists, It'd, it'd be almost like <clears throat> um, uh, like a prospect game for like baseball or something. Once you get down to like the top ones, there's going to be people from record companies out there watching and listening and going, I like what here yeah, they're yeah, doing yeah. here. Let's go talk to them afterwards. Um, so basically, this is kind of like Battle of the Bands for like country, bluegrass, folk music, um, which doesn't sound all that exciting, but I bet it would have been pretty fucking cool festival to go to um so in 1983 uh the winner was robert earl Keane, who i've never heard of um some other notable finalists and winners from over the years of this were uh steve earl who uh heard the song copperhead road yeah that's steve earl um and another one that went on to be a pretty big name was lyle lovett the multi-time grammar winner and former mrs uh, mr julia roberts um and he also kind of looks like Boomhauer. Like, if you mixed Randy Travis and Boomhauer, that's what Lyle Lovett looks like. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the McDonnell Douglas DC-9 that he was on, and again, this this is the plane that I was talking about beforehand, has an impressive body count. 
uh, a total of 2,101 fatalities from this particular model alone. Uh, including the November 70, uh, yeah, November 14th, 1970 crash that killed basically the entire Marshall University football team. Yep. Um, and it's also the model that has the furthest survived freefall of 33,000 feet by a European, I don't remember what country she was from, uh, flight attendant by the name of Vesna Vulovic. Um, she fell 33,000 feet with no parachute and was the lone survivor of the plane crash that she was involved in. That's uh, about seven miles that she fell and didn't die. That's fucking impressive. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you imagine? Something must have. Like, she must have. So if I remember, something. if I remember correctly, how it started was there was something. Um, there'd been like some maintenance issues with the plane that hadn't been hadn't been tended to. Um, and one of the wings ripped off, which led to the door being ripped open, and she was sucked out of the plane. And then the plane just fucking nosedived into the ground, and she survived the fall. Once again, she, like I said, she must have hit something or something to, like, help her... I'm not ruling out divine intervention. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, at that point, like, holy shit. Um, it, it's kind of, it's safe to say that the early 80s, this was a flying mass murderer, and it had a pretty... Bad, by the early 80s, I should say. It was a pretty bad track record. Um, Air Canada Flight 797 was cruising at an altitude of 33,000 feet over Kentucky when uh, the cabin crew reported to the pilot, quote, excuse me, but there's a fire in the washroom. Bathroom's on fire. How the fuck does that happen? I don't know. Um, we'll find out a little bit as to probably why that happened here in a second. Um so the pilot has to kill power to the bathroom to try to shut the electrical fire down. Well, when he does that, it's kind of on the same circuit as some of the other systems on the plane, including uh, autopilot and like your steering and stuff. Uh, so they're fighting this plane while they're trying not to crash. Um, and for about 17 minutes, they fight this this plane until they can land on the ground at the Cincinnati International Airport in Hebron, Kentucky. Because the Cincinnati International Airport's in Kentucky. Yep. You know. Um, it's actually it's actually literally on the border yeah, between the it's, two. It's, yeah, it's across the river. Yeah. From, yeah. Um, I've landed at it. I've, I've flown into that airport. It's called the... It's the... Well, it's technically, I think it's... No, it's not the one. Well, it's it's. I think it was the Cincinnati, Ohio airport. Yeah. Um, that I flew in. So, like, if it t if if anybody, I did fly into the Kentucky side. Well, for anybody that's not familiar with how close Cincinnati is to Kentucky, um, like for international listeners, there's a baseball player named Adam Dunn who played for the Cincinnati Reds that hit a home run from Cincinnati into Kentucky. That's how close the stadium, at least, is to the border of Kentucky. So he put it out of the park and it landed in a different state, which nobody else can say they've ever done that. Hmm. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So the, the plane rolls to a stop and commences an emergency evacuation. Passengers are packed in the aisles and they're trying to escape the cabin, which is now full of smoke. And... When they open the doors of the plane, it immediately catches fire because you just introduced fuel into. Yep. Yeah. You induced oxygen to the correct situation, um, and it ignited from one end of the plane to the other in a couple of seconds, just up in flames. Uh, I've seen pictures of it, and it is. It would have been fucking horrifying to be on that plane. Yeah. Because like the windows are smashed out, and there is literally flames just shooting out of the windows of this plane it would have been fucking terrifying yeah um so of the 46 people on board 23 live 23 die including stan and his entire group that he's with um the, this plane this this exact plane that was now on fire 
at an airport in Cincinnati, well, in, in Kentucky, technically, um, in 1979, so just a few years previous, had been involved in another incident where the rear passenger bulkhead separated from the passenger compartment while it was taking off from Logan International Airport in Boston. The decompression blasted the tail cone off of the plane and damaged both the flight control cables and the cables transmitting pilot inputs to the plane's rear-mounted engines. Uh, the plane, I'm sorry, the pilots had to fight the plane back down safely. Uh, they made it. Nobody seriously hurt. Bumps and bruises here and there because you're in a fucking plane crash. Mm. Um, so after the accident, the plane was repaired and then returned to service. I think something like a, a catastrophic failure like that, maybe scrap it at that point. You know, part of it fucking broke off. <laughs> The whole ass end of this thing just fell off the plane. Like, m yeah. maybe we scrap it and, you know, we'll, we'll use the seats in this one. We'll put one of the fucking engines in that. Eh. Instead, we'll just duct tape and rivet this piece of shit back together and send it on its way. Yeah. Um, although the case, uh, the cause of uh, difficulties was not conclusively pinpointed, uh, numerous wires had to be cut and re-spliced to access damage, uh, uh, damage structure behind them. And it is thought that the quality of the electrical work may have been lacking. Probably considering you had an electric fire in your fucking bathroom behind the mirror. Which is where the fire started, was in behind the uh, the vanity, they called it, in the in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, so by spring, late spring 1983, the problem had become so bad that the auxiliary power unit was malfunctioning on an average of one and a half times a day. Your backup power is dying on this plane, and you're still flying it. Why? Doesn't make any sense to me. Makes no sense to anybody. Um, uh, so this this exact incident that claimed the lives of Stan Rogers and the rest of his people that he was with is the reason that all airplanes from then up until up through now, every single airplane manufactured has to have smoke detectors on them like onboard smoke detectors they're not like stuck to the fucking inside of it like you, they are at your house where you have to change a battery when it chirps every you know couple of years so they're 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 internal smoke detectors but they have to be on planes they weren't up until then it was not a thing um so rumors kind of started swirling about stan's involvement in the crash after his death um one source said and this is coming from a survivor um, before most likely succumbing to smoke <coughs> to smoke inh inhalation, inhalation, he used his last moments to guide other passengers to safety uh, with his with his booming voice. Um, so, according to the NTSB, who ran a full investigation on this thing, uh, they said, "Well, that didn't happen because he was most likely dead before the plane doors even opened." I like to think maybe he he got a chance to help other people. That'd be good. Um, so his legacy lasts to this day with the Stan Rogers Folk Festival, which is held in uh, Nova Scotia every year. Um, last one was held in 20, uh, 2023. There isn't a date set for this one yet, but it was in like the tail end of July last year. So maybe it'll still happen. Who knows? Hmm. Um, and like I mentioned, as we were going through it, uh, tons, tons of different bands have covered his, have used his music as their own, um, done covers of stuff. Um, a lot of his stuff is still used in like Canadian TV shows and like movies and stuff like that. So he's got a, a, a lasting legacy. Um, he is the one of the two. I don't know nothing. Oh, about. dude, I don't. I don't even know if they're his music. Oh man, you you gotta on your way home. Just throw some. Uh, you, I I think you'll like it. Think you'll like it. He's got a great voice. <coughs> um, I'm very. I'm, I'm I'm like so. I don't know. I'm so picky about music. Hold on. I, I've gotten picky. Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one on YouTube here. Um, I will throw a link to this up on the show page. Um, this is from a documentary that was done about him the year after he died called One Warm Line, which is a, a line from um, Northwest Passage. Um, and this is a, a shot from the documentary, a, a short little video of... Uh, him and his band sitting around a table. I'm assuming either at his house or a camp of some sort. And Stan is fucking loaded. Like, 
If you watch the video, you can see how drunk he is in the video. And, uh, goddamn, they're just, it's so good. Look at this man's eyes, okay? He's, he's shittered. And they are just going to town here. Um, you're going to see a, a blonde dude with very long hair next to him here in a second. That's his brother, uh, Garnet, who actually continued to tour after Stan died covering his stuff. Um, and there's one dude in here. That, again, this is the early 80s, and Homeboy's got a black hoodie on, and he looks like Parker from Gold Rush. <laughs> this guy right here, they, they, they'll show him in a second. These dudes are pickled, like... Was I wrong? <laughs> he kind of looks like Parker. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's... Uh, huh. Man, that's uh, that's Jim Croce and fucking Stan Rogers. Uh, Interesting. Kind of a bummer, because like, both of them are super talented musicians. I like all of their music. They were. and uh, They were super talented. And they, they both died way too young. And, you know, again, not appreciated really when they were alive because they... A lot of the greats died when they were young. Yeah, and that's the problem. That's what sucks is like... I mean, look at uh, uh, Richie Valens. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was... Fucking him and Buddy Holly, 20s, they were only in their like mid-20s. Something like that. I mean, but Buddy Holly... And the Big Bopper like, was in his fucking 40s at that point. Yeah, but, but you know. like, I mean... But like, Buddy Holly was like... He was a kid. He was on top of his fucking yeah. game. Like, I mean, he had some some zingers out there that were like... Fuck, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. Another one that died way too young. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know people are probably... You know, Kurt Cobain, Kurt Cobain. No. Kurt, Kurt Cobain died at the exact time where he needed to. Where he should have. Because he, he even knew, like, if you've ever listened to anything he said, he knew that he if he had recorded and been around for way longer hit their shit would have fallen off and they would have just not been nirvana anymore you know maybe but who knows yeah but that's also a different completely different style of music you know of course but it's but uh, but it's also a different death i mean yeah um yeah so anyway uh with that said go on over to uh studio.com go check them out god they got Bluetooth headphone. Well, they don't have headphones. Sorry, I keep saying that. Damn. Earbuds. Earbuds. Quite the variety of those. And they have Bluetooth Speakers. speakers. Um, find what you want. Put it in your basket. Go to checkout. Put the promo code of DarkWindows15 in to get 15% off your entire purchase. Uh, also, uh, like Kevin said earlier, gone over to uh, patreon.com forward slash DarkWindows podcast. $5 a month will get you an extra episode of this beautiful podcast. Oh, See, I didn't say free. Oh, uh -huh. and guess what else it does now, though? What? As of this week, it also gets you access to this episode a couple days early. Oh, yeah. Or we also have the $1 tier, yes. where if you don't want the bonus episode, you just want the ep our regular episode a little early with no ads, it's a fucking dollar. It's a dollar. It's a dollar. You know? Or if you want the bonus, it's $5. It's not like it's $5 and then you have to pay for the $1. It's not 6 It's 5 bucks. Yep. Um getting double the content for five dollars yes uh see you can find us on facebook uh dark windows podcast two different ones one uh, one's the business and one's the fun uh we've had some like at least i don't know five new members join yeah we're up over welcome. 400 members on the page on the group page now so welcome to the club welcome to the cult welcome it's to not a cult. Ha happy fun time um all the above uh thank you for joining if it was a cult, they would have had to give us all their shit first, and they didn't. They, they, so. they just don't know that yet. No, well, no, that's how cults work, though. But I mean, they we've don't done know enough. that yet, except for that one we did last week. Man, that shit was wild. That was yeah. fun, though. Um, let's see. We're gonna uh, beat this dead man up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for no reason. What the fuck? Why not? Uh, also, uh, you can find us on Instagram, Dark Windows Pod, uh, X, or whatever. Dark Windows yeah, Pod. We're really not on there. I don't think. I much, mean, but, but yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, also, we should plug it. Uh, if you go to Age of Radio on YouTube. Uh, Age of Radio Verse. Verse. Uh, actually, I think if you punch in Age of Radio, then Dark Windows Podcast on YouTube, you can find us now. Yeah. We have, we're on, through their, uh, Age of Radio's, yeah. uh, YouTube page. There yeah. we have a YouTube, if you prefer to listen that way. Yeah. 
Um, maybe eventually we'll do our own YouTube. Maybe. maybe. Uh, but yeah, other than and that, again, if, if this if this is a topic that people like and you guys want to hear us talk about dead musicians more often, um, I mean, we can definitely add this into the the arsenal because like you could cover some, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, um, and there's some that are definitely more controversial than what we just did here because these were just like, you know, wholesome boys. Yeah, that, that, well, it doesn't that have to died be like, unfortunately. It doesn't have to be plane crashes. It can be. Uh, Supposed suicides. He was murdered. He was murdered. He was murdered for sure. Uh, or um, you know, drive-bys, uh. <laughs> where they the police just fucking straight up refused to solve them. Yes, because they don't care that much. Because it was just you know, I don't know, just two black dudes, but they were super fucking popular. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. Other than that, uh, just because you can't see on the dark doesn't mean the dark can't see into you. Have a great week and. Back next week. Toodaloo.